The following video showcases some of the most terrifying true crocodile attack stories covered on this channel so far. At over 5.5 meters in length and having the most powerful bite force on the planet, crocodiles are some of the most deadly and terrifying beasts alive. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most brutal crocodile attacks you will ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. On May 31st, 2022, 47-year-old Sean McGinnis dived into the water at the lake in Largo, Florida beside a disc golf club looking for lost frisbees. He was homeless and had made a living by retrieving discs and selling them back to players at the park. Sean had been living in a friend's basement for eight years, but was now asked to find a proper job and leave by January due to the conflicts with his roommate's family arising from his presence. The pressure compounded by his dire circumstance made him take the risk of venturing deeper and farther into the lake looking for lost discs to resell. He had been successful in avoiding authorities so far by going into the water in the dark of night when the park was closed. He would sometimes pull 30 discs from the water in one night, reselling them for 5 or $10 a piece which would help him scrape a living for a few more days. According to Sean's friend, he was aware of the no swimming signs put up near the lake shore, but displayed a callousness to the warning and was more concerned about his immediate financial needs. He was also becoming increasingly ill and was diagnosed with a malignant tumor that he knew would shorten his life anyway. Unbeknownst to him, the lake was home to hundreds of American alligators residing in the deeper water that rarely surfaced or splashed in the water enough for anyone to notice. These marine reptiles are the apex predators of the waters in Florida and can weigh more than 600 pounds and be over 4 meters long from head to tail. They usually hunt small fish beneath the water and rarely come out to catch mammals or birds that come close enough to the shore. The American alligator has over 80 conical teeth but their bite is not strong enough to rip through flesh or chew on large animals. They instead grab their prey and spin in the water to tear larger animals into pieces before swallowing these parts whole. On that fateful Tuesday morning at around 4 a.m., Sean dipped his toes into the cold water and took steady steps further ahead. The lake was shallow at the shore but dropped significantly just a few feet in. It was dark and silent all around as he flailed his hands beneath the water hoping to hit a disc. He had done this several times before, but the sight of the vast, deep water alone at midnight was still enough to make him feel eerie and uneasy. City lights lit the distance several kilometers away, and the park was expected to be empty for several hours till it opened at 9 a.m. Sean was only feet deep in the water when he found his first disc. It was damaged, but was enough to fetch a few dollars. He threw it to the shore and went back looking for more. He quickly realized that he had exhausted what he could hope to find in these shallow waters and would have to move further into the lake. In just a few minutes, he found himself chest deep in the lake searching for lost frisbees. Anything he salvaged, he threw back to the shore where he was collecting them. Desperation compounded by the urgency of time before daylight forced him to venture deeper into the lake than he had ever been before. But Sean was hopelessly ignorant of the deadly trap he had just walked into. At around 4.30 in the morning, he heard a light splash in the distance. In the dark, empty night in the middle of the water, he was startled to hear a sound from anything that wasn't him. He looked into the distance, anticipating a guard or park ranger, but then he heard the splash again, this time much closer and right in front of him. He noticed a set of glowing eyes surface from the water, peering at him. He finally realized the predicament he was in as a shiver of terror ran down his spine. Caught in the middle of the lake, helpless and alone, Sean screamed for help, but the shore was still several meters away, and he was caught helpless on the alligator's turf. The animals swam up in front of Sean, stopping him dead in his tracks. He looked back and noticed another set of eyes among the dark background of the lake. He found himself alone, frightened and cornered. A large snout surfaced from behind him and snapped shut with his thigh in its tight grip. He let out a scream in agony as the animal's teeth crushed his bones and tore through his flesh. No amount of kicking and screaming seemed to throw the alligator off. It then started to spin in the water with Sean's leg firmly in its jaws. 
and ripped off his right leg. Sean screamed in intense pain and struggled forward with all his might, stumbling toward the shore with the weight of the water crashing against him. Left bleeding and unable to walk, his fate was now all but sealed. The second alligator came up in front of him, biting down on his right arm and ripping it off in the same gruesome fashion. He had lost two limbs, but the adrenaline and shock prevented him from slipping away into unconsciousness. He lay there in the water splashing and struggling to stay afloat as the reptilian predators circled around him in a cynical fashion. The commotion attracted more alligators, and the attack turned into a feeding frenzy for the predators. One after another, the animals bit down on his body and his limbs. Sean was mercilessly mauled to pieces, losing three limbs before he finally succumbed to his devastating injuries and died. The limbs of the dead man satiated the animals for a while and his body floated on the water in a blood-reddened spot on the lake. His mangled and bloodied torso with only one leg attached was discovered four hours later by a man walking his dog near the park. His face was completely mauled and it became difficult to identify him when no one came out to claim his body for several hours after the incident. It was only the next day that his identity was finally uncovered using dental evidence and his roommate was made aware of his friend's death. It was the first fatal alligator attack in the state since 2019, and news of his tragic demise sent shockwaves across the country. Police investigations questioned the lapse in security at the park, despite an earlier incident in 2020 of a man bitten by alligators while retrieving lost items from the lake. It was later discovered that Sean had been strictly warned not to enter the lake after he had been discovered by security a few months prior. Unfortunately, instead of heeding the warnings, he decided to carry on when the park was closed at night. Researchers of reptile behavior claimed that this brutal death was the result of a chain of consequences. It was the alligators mating season in Florida which meant the animals were more guarding of their territory and saw anything foreign in the water as a potential threat. The dark of night also made it more likely for them to swim closer to the shore, increasing chances of encounters with humans who would sometimes come close to the lake shore to enjoy the view of the water. The following night, authorities and trappers were dispatched to the area to locate the alligators that had killed Sean McGinnis. Two of them were euthanized after being found swimming close to where his body had been retrieved. The alligators measured over 10 feet and were transported to a nearby sanctuary. They were cut open in hopes of finding Sean's arm and legs so that they could be buried alongside him. Unfortunately, nothing could be salvaged from the abdomens of the reptiles except a few pieces of bone and cloth. Sean's roommate expressed immense regret and remorse at having asked him to leave and could not help but blame himself for the tragic turn of events that had led to Sean's brutal death. The Largo Police Department closed down the park for several days and tightened security around the lake to stop people from going in to look for lost items. There was no one to grieve for his demise apart from a few friends that he knew. He had no family in Florida and had no contact with distant relatives in over eight years. But for Sean, his death served as a reminder against venturing too close to vicious predators of this kind and shocked parkgoers into complying with the rules and regulations around the lake, fearful that they too would meet their unfortunate final affliction. Matt and Melissa Graves from Elkhorn, Nebraska had decided to take their children on the holiday of a lifetime. After months of excitement building in the household, the vacation had finally arrived and they headed to Florida in June, 2016. Their destination, Disney World, Orlando. Disney World comprises 25,000 acres of land. Its theme parks, studios, and Animal Kingdom attract almost 60 million people a year. It is one of the most visited vacation resorts in the world and offers a huge range of attractions to visitors, both young and old. After experiencing some of the very best rides in the world, the family headed down to the relative quiet of the Seven Seas Lagoon one evening. Seven Seas was a man-made lagoon that offered boating and fishing experiences. The water was perfectly still. The bright sunshine was reflecting off the water's surface. The lake was surrounded by grasses, some woodland and golden sandy beaches. There were a number of people walking along the shores, running on the beaches and fishing from a couple of boats. 
It was the third day of the Graves family incredible holiday, and the lagoon was situated at the front of the Grand Floridian Hotel where they were staying at the time. Although it was late for the children, around 8.30 p.m., Matt and Melissa decided that it was their holidays, that they would stay up this once. On the shores of the lake, there was an outdoor movie experience for them to enjoy. It was something that they had never done before. Matt and Melissa sat and watched the movie, but as the children were so young, they weren't interested in what was on the big screen. Instead, they played on the beach, digging up the sand and splashing in the water. Matt and Melissa had packed with them a bucket and spade. They pulled them out of their bag and handed them to the children. Two-year-old Lane jumped up and down excitedly, toddling onto the sand that ran down to the edge of the lake. He grabbed the bucket from his older sister and began filling it up with sand. His parents helped him turn the bucket over, tap it three times, and then lift it up to reveal a sandcastle. Lane squealed in delight, and the family did this over and over. After some considerable time playing in the sand, Matt and Melissa decided that it was getting late and time to go. When they got up to leave, Lane cried out in defiance. His parents looked at each other. They decided to give in to their toddler's demands and stay a little longer. What harm could it do? When it came time to dig the trench around the mound of sandcastles, Lane picked up the bucket once more and ran to the lake. Wading into the ankle-deep water, Matt and Melissa watched on as he splashed into the shallows. He patted his feet up and down, looking down as his toes sank into the muddy, sandy substrate. Then, the two-year-old bent over and scooped up a bucket of water to take back to the moat they were building. Suddenly, and without warning, there was a huge commotion. In an instant, their happy, playful toddler, who was giggling and grinning, was snatched by an alligator, just feet from his family. Matt leapt up from the sand. He jumped onto the alligator, wrestling it into the water. The alligator had its jaws wrapped around Lane's head. Matt thrust his hand into the alligator's mouth. He tried desperately to pry them open, but the great beast thrashed around, throwing Matt off of its back. In the frantic commotion, Matt claims that another alligator went for him in a frenzied attack. It is unclear whether the minor injuries he suffered were from the alligator that took Lane or from a second one joining in on the attack. No sooner than it had happened, the alligator vanished, sinking beneath the water's surface. In a moment of shock and terror, the family were forced to watch their young son being dragged underwater by the terrifying seven-foot beast. In those first heart-stopping seconds, Matt and Melissa ran into the water where their boy had been dragged under. A lifeguard was alerted and came running to the scene. The water was murky and brown. Matt dived under the water again and again, scrambling about with his hands to feel for any sign of their son. He couldn't see a thing. He couldn't feel anything. Every time he reached out, all he did was grab fistfuls of the squelchy, muddy lake's bottom. As he came up for air, he saw Melissa frantically rushing through the shallows, screaming and yelling. Lane made for easy prey. He was only 37 inches tall and weighed 30 pounds. Standing defenseless in the shallows, he was an easy target. Alligators are ambush hunters. They are apex predators in their environment. They typically take fish, turtles, muskrats, birds, and deer. Unlike their crocodile cousins, they are typically less aggressive and it is rare for them to attack humans. But when they do, they rely on the element of surprise and their bite force. The pressure from an alligator's bite is comparable in pressure to the weight of a small pickup truck. Onlookers at the lagoon could do nothing but watch in absolute horror, hoping upon hope that the boy would somehow resurface. But with each passing minute, their hopes were dashed. Emergency services arrived on the scene within minutes. Jumping into a boat, they scoured the lake. A massive search operation involving over 50 officers was initiated and devastatingly, Orange County divers came across Lane the following afternoon, 17 hours after the attack. He was lying limp and lifeless in just six feet of water. Submerged, he had been left by the alligator only yards from where he had been taken. Heartbreakingly, he was just feet from where Matt and Melissa had frantically searched for him but the muddy waters churned up by the commotion in the water made it impossible to see below the surface. Lane's body was pulled from the water, carried back to the beach and into the arms of his devastated mother. Rescuers pronounced him dead at the scene. There were only a couple of puncture wounds where the alligator had grabbed him. Wildlife officers concluded that although Lane had suffered trauma to his head and neck, he had drowned when the alligator had dragged him into the water. His body had been untouched after the attack. 
It is likely that the action of Matt jumping onto the alligator and attempting to free his son from its powerful grip had startled the predator, and after dragging the boy underwater, it had then let go. Lake Kissimmee near Orlando has the second biggest populations of alligators in Florida. It is home to almost 2,000. Their large numbers force some individuals to look elsewhere for food and territory to avoid competition. Some make it into recreational lakes frequented by locals and tourists alike. Following the devastating incident, officers captured and euthanized six alligators from the lagoon. When the alligators were examined, their stomachs were empty, suggesting that the reptiles inhabiting the Disney lagoon were hungry. The attack on Lane had been predatory. His actions had not provoked the alligator in any way. He was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Since June 2016, Disney World has erected warning signs along the edges of the lagoon, warning tourists of the presence of alligators. Although alligator attacks in Florida are rare, they do occur and they have devastating consequences. Lane was simply enjoying his vacation with the people who loved him most in the world. The alligator was simply taking advantage of an opportunity, one that resulted in Lane Graves' terrifying final affliction. It was Saturday the 21st of December 1985 in far north Queensland, Australia, and a small group of friends were preparing for a pre-Christmas Day celebration. They weren't planning on doing anything too fancy, they'd all known each other for a long time and they wanted to spend some time together before family gatherings swept them up during the holidays. With this sentiment in mind, the group organized a barbecue. At 11pm, the friends met at the Turner Butterfly Farm with steaks and coolers of drinks. It was a hot day and even at 11 p.m. the group could still feel the heat. They got the grill going and soon the sweet smell of cooking meat filled the air. Conversations and drinks flowed easily and everyone was relaxed and unbothered. They congratulated themselves on another peaceful Christmas together and discussed plans for the new year. By 11.30 p.m. the five friends in the group decided to explore the woods. Their location was right next to the Queensland Tropical Rainforest and they'd grown bored of sitting in one spot chattering. The rest of the group had nothing to worry about. After all, there was a lot of human activity around the area and the five were grown adults. They were very much capable of taking care of themselves. Besides, they didn't plan on being gone for long. They were going to look around for a bit before rejoining the group. Maybe they'd spot a koala or other wildlife. The five picked a trail and wasted no time diving into the thick blanket of the forest. Soon, they spotted a boardwalk that cut through the jungle and they decided to follow it. A few minutes of walking brought them to a private dock overlooking Barat Creek, a stream of water from the Daintree River. The side of the dock sent their plans of going back down the drain. The five friends sat on the pier and started a new conversation, enjoying the night air as they talked and laughed. A single lamppost hanging above their heads gave them plenty of light and they were perfectly content with their present arrangement. 11.30 p.m. turned to midnight, but the conversation hadn't yet dwindled. One of the five, Maurice Meeling, suggested they hop into the water to cool off. The weather was still warm and they trekked there so it was reasonable that a dip in the creek was warranted. The Daintree River is home to an ever-growing population of crocodiles and northeastern Australia is commonly known as croc country. The friends knew this. They were all aware that their spot was close to the mouth of the Daintree, where the river opens to the Corral Sea, and as the tides made the waters rise and fall, bull sharks swam into the river looking for whatever lowly animal dared to tread the waters. The sharks were scary enough, but crocodile attacks are 100 times deadlier than shark attacks. Sometimes sharks approach humans out of curiosity and get spooked into biting. Crocodiles have one mission in mind when they approach their prey and that is to kill. The group stayed where they were, but getting into the water was a tempting prospect. The tides were low, so it was only a few feet deep and that ruled out the possibility of sharks. Additionally, the water's surface was still, like a blank slate. There didn't seem to be any impending danger and it was easy for anyone to walk in and wade about. If there was any danger, they could surely spot it and get away in time. With those thoughts in mind, Maurice steeled his conviction and got into the water. He stayed close to the edge, did a quick lap around the water, then hurried right back out like someone was hot on his heels. Even though the night was hot, Maurice was suddenly shivering. Being in the water filled him with a strong sense of dread. 
Every nerve ending in his body was drawn taut and goosebumps prickled his flesh. The worst part was he couldn't even explain why he suddenly wanted to get the heck out of there. Something just felt off and he couldn't put his finger on what it was. Trying to keep his emotions in check, Maurice told his three friends to stay out of the water. They were still chatting on the docks and they were better off staying put for the remainder of the evening. Unfortunately, seeing Maurice in the water filled the rest of them with the courage to sink their feet into the cool water. Considering how calm the water remained, the tide still low, and Maurice had just gone in and come out unscathed, they wanted to dip in the pleasant water as well. Whatever predators beneath the surface were indeed far away, and again, they could simply spot the danger and get out fast enough. Quick to get into the water next were friends John and Rob, followed closely by the 43-year-old shopkeeper, Barrel Ruck. John and Rob effortlessly got into the murky black water and remained chatting close to the dock even though they did not want to go further. Maurice and his wife Selena remained in the safety of the jetty, enjoying the view from there while Beryl waited around in the water. It seemed like the perfect night, just five friends having fun, what could go wrong? Unbeknownst to the group, Maurice's intuition was spot on. A deadly beast was hunting them. In the blackness of the night and the stillness of the water, just out of reach of the lamp's soft glow, lay a massive crocodile. In the darkness, the animal had no problem camouflaging with its surroundings. It remained hidden below the surface of the water, away from the weak scope of unsuspecting human eyes. Its movements were calculated so as not to shake the waters, and it had its sights set on the group, its dinner. Slowly, patiently, the predator moved closer to its prey. John and Beryl were being hunted, and they didn't even know it. Suddenly, the night went still. Insects and scurrying nocturnal animals in the rainforest fell silent as if they knew what would happen next and were holding their breaths in morbid anticipation. A shiver ran down John's spine, and dread covered him like a cold blanket on an even colder day. It was the same feeling Maurice had just felt moments earlier. John wasn't exactly sure it was either, he knew he had to get out of the water immediately. He scrambled for the dock, reaching up to hang on the wooden podium, but before he could even lift himself, the water exploded all around him, and the force sent him flailing and falling into the water. Water shot up his nostrils, in his mouth, and into his eyes. In his confusion and panic, he couldn't see what was going on, but his friends on the dock could, and what they saw before them was a gruesome sight. Before them was a humongous crocodile, standing about 17 to 18 feet in length, and it had its teeth sunken into Beryl's flesh. Her face was a mask of pure terror. Her eyes were wide and her mouth was open as if she wanted to scream, but had suddenly forgotten how. The crocodile dragged her beneath the water surface before she could even try to let that scream out. It was the 22nd of December, 1985, and Beryl Ruck was gone, never to be seen again. Beryl's friends were not only left mentally and emotionally scarred for life, but they were also left with the heavy burden of telling others what had happened to the poor woman and the guilt of their actions. If only they had remained on the farm with the others or at least chatted until midnight before returning, maybe she would have still been alive. A few weeks later, a giant croc was killed nearby. The crocodile was dubbed Big Jim and found in its stomach was the arm of a female human. In 1985, DNA science was not fully developed, so it was assumed that the arm belonged to the 43-year-old shopkeeper, Beryl Ruck. Crocodile attacks are more frequent than shark attacks because foolish humans constantly ignore all warnings and wander into croc territory. Beryl's tragic story serves as an important lesson. Never swim in strange waters, especially not at night. And never mess with nature because nature won't hesitate to bite back leading to your unfortunate final affliction. Henry Coetzee always knew death was coming for him. He often spoke of it, knowing his adventurous lifestyle was pushing him to his premature end. But his cravings for adventure overcame him. In his memoirs, he wrote of feeling a deep depression as soon as each expedition was over. He was only ever happy when he was alone, pushing himself to his limits and way beyond. Hendry grew up in South Africa. He found school tedious and boring, but thrived in the arts. After graduating, he went traveling before joining the military. At the age of 21, he was back on the dark continent and was looking for adventure. 
In 1997, the mighty Zambezi River, bordering Zambia and Zimbabwe, was fast becoming a hotspot for thrill-seeking tourists. Outfitters set up bungee jumps and skydives over the awesome Victoria Falls, but most popular of all was whitewater rafting. As a cocky 21-year-old Hendry, who had never kayaked or rafted a river in his life, landed himself a job with Peter Meredith's Whitewater Rafting Company. After learning how to roll and ride a kayak in a swimming pool, Hendry took to one of the world's most advanced commercial rivers. He guided tourists through grade 5 rapids and quickly became a popular guide. Peter described Hendry as having more balls than brains and on one occasion, whilst the entire group portaged their rafts and kayaks around a deadly class 6 rapid, Hendry ran at it in his kayak without telling anyone. He barely made it through, but thought he was the bee's knees. Peter warned him he'd be fired if he ever pulled a stunt like that again. Peter and Hendry became good friends. In 2004, they embarked on an epic adventure with a small team. The task was to follow the River Nile from source to sea. They paddled the 4,130 miles from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean together. This preceded Hendry's solo paddle of the Congo a few years later. The journey took him five months to complete. He survived being ambushed and hunted by cannibalistic Gombe tribesmen. He dodged hippos and crocodiles. He slept on the banks of the river, protected only by his bivouac and the flames of his fire. After returning home, Hendry decided that it was time to settle down. This adventurous lifestyle couldn't last forever, and he was taking too many risks. He had met a girl and realized that there was perhaps more to life than adrenaline-filled expeditions. But these feelings weren't to last long. In 2010, an email pinged in his inbox. Two professional American kayakers, Ben Stokesbury and Chris Korbelik, wanted to navigate the upper Congo River. They knew Hendry was the perfect guide for the job. Hendry stood fast on his original decision, no more kayaking or exploration, but he was happy to help them plan their route. He wrote a detailed itinerary for them, adding detail that only an explorer of his caliber would know. As he mapped out their journey, Hendry felt that familiar restlessness return. The call of the wild echoed once more in his ears. After months of helping them plan their trip, Hendry finally relented and succumbed to the promise of an epic adventure. The trio set out on the two-month trip through the Congo's tributaries. They began along the Ruzizi River at the end of October 2010. They planned to be home by Christmas. Hendry's girlfriend was looking forward to seeing him again after what he promised to be his final expedition. It turns out, he was right. Whenever the three kayakers paused along the river to rest or make camp, they would speak with locals who lived on the riverbanks. They had an agreement with the International Rescue Committee, who helped refugees and rural communities. In exchange for some logistical help, Hendry had promised feedback from locals. Upon speaking to one community, they were told that, as well as needing clean water and education, they also needed help tackling a major crocodile problem. In the past 20 years, 125 people had been taken by this prolific predator. Hendry and the other made a mental note of this comment. What they didn't know was the years of battles in the region between neighboring communities had resulted in more than 5.4 million people being killed. Most of these people had been dumped in the rivers. Most of these people had been eaten by crocodiles. As a result, these reptilian beasts had grown to enormous sizes and had a taste for human blood. On December 7, 2010, the trio had been paddling for some time when they came to a sharp bend in the river. Although Ben and Chris were professional paddlers and well-known in the world of extreme sports, Hendry had to teach them how to kayak in the African wilderness. He taught them to regularly tap their kayaks to create noise, stay away from eddies where hippos might attack, and keep clear of sunbathing crocodiles on the riverbanks. On the day of the attack, the three of them had spotted a few three-foot crocodiles on the muddy banks. They were harmless and the trio glided by, admiring the natural scene from their plastic boats. If a larger croc was spotted in the water, protocol was for the three kayakers to come together and paddle as fast as they could to outrun the potential threat. So far, the journey had been broken up into hair-raising whitewater obstacles and calm, gentle stretches that meandered silently through the still African bush. Around the corner, the river was about a hundred feet wide and flowed gently. The three men were paddling close to one another. They had to concentrate so that their blades didn't touch. 
Ben was slightly in front, Hendry in the center, and Chris trailing a few yards behind. Ben's eyes darted from left to right as he scanned the waterways and sloping embankment for any sign of trouble. The water was so calm with the only ripples emanating from the men's paddles. There were no telltale signs of predatory crocodiles or territorial hippos. Usually they would spot the knobby protrusions of a crocodile's log-like head and two gleaming eyes just above the water's surface, but today was different. Unbeknownst to them, something was stirring underwater. Something was stalking them from the murky depths. Nothing could have alerted them to this stealthy predator. Not a ripple, nor a bubble, until it was too late. Ben looked back over his shoulder to check the others were keeping form. As he did so, he saw an enormous crocodile silently emerge from the water just to Hendry's left-hand side. Hendry gasped at its sudden appearance and cried, Oh my God! It wasn't a cry of fear, terror, or desperation. It was more a matter-of-fact exclamation. To suddenly see the biggest crocodile lift its head out of the water had taken Hendry completely by surprise. Those were the only words he managed to shout. In an instant, the crocodile had grabbed Hendry's left shoulder in its jaws. It pulled him underwater, quickly, like lightning. The immense pressure from a bite force of over 4,000 psi seized Hendry, crushing his chest and neck. Hendry was fastened snugly into the cockpit of his kayak. Ben and Chris watched in abject terror as the upturned kayak shook and tumbled above the water for a few agonizing seconds. Then the kayak was pulled downwards and out of sight. Moments later, the red plastic boat bobbed back up to the surface and righted itself. The cockpit was empty. Hendry was nowhere to be seen. Hendry was likely to have been taken to the bottom of the river where the crocodile began its feast. Knocking the air from his lungs, disorientating him with sharp twists and rolls in an attempt to drown its prey. Mercifully, Hendry likely passed out from the immense compression on his body before being taken down under. Judging by the size of its head, the crocodile was estimated to be about 15 feet long, weighing in excess of 2,000 pounds. Ben and Chris made a mad dash for it. Paddling with all their might, they churned through the green Lukuga River. Frantically, they made their way to the riverside village of Kabea Maji. Firing their kayaks at the riverbank, they leapt out and ran into the village, shouting for help. The locals fled in a mad panic. The two white men, donning life jackets and helmets, had taken them completely by surprise. But when everyone had calmed down, Ben and Chris managed to ask for a motorboat to go and look for Hendry. The villagers shuffled uneasily and shook their heads. They told them that they no longer set foot on the river, because in the last five years alone, seven of them had been taken by the crocodiles, simply plucked from the decks of their boats. Ben and Chris dashed onto a nearby bridge, desperately looking upstream for their fallen friend. The entire village, some 200 people, followed them. Then they saw something. From around the corner, something floated into view. A black paddle, and then Hendry's red kayak bobbed up and down on the river, floating closer and closer, and then passing under the bridge, right beneath Ben and Chris's feet. It was immaculate, no sign of a struggle, no scratches, no cracks, no blood. Hendry was never seen again. Sensing something wasn't right, Hendry's girlfriend logged onto Facebook. Her heart skipped a beat as messages of condolence for Hendry appeared on her screen. This couldn't be happening. This must be some kind of mistake. They were supposed to be meeting soon. He was nearing the end of his expedition, his very last expedition. Distraught and devastated, Hendry's girlfriend still journeyed to the Ugandan bar on New Year's Eve, where they were planning on meeting. Through the dimmed lighting and steady bass beat of the music, she searched the hazy dance floor for Hendry. Still hoping upon hope that she would see that dazzling, confident smile pop up from the crowds. The clock struck 12, the partygoers erupted in cheers, but Hendry was nowhere to be seen. He had met his unfortunate final affliction. The Ramri Island Massacre is the terrifying true story of an entire Japanese army division being devoured overnight by hordes of saltwater crocodiles in the swamps of Burma during World War II. Saltwater crocs can weigh over a ton and grow to more than 7 meters in length. Their biting grip is one of the strongest of any land animal, and they are known to aggressively defend their territory, even against humans that dare venture too close. 
It was early 1945 and the Second World War had pushed the Axis forces to the edge of surrender in the Pacific War. In the dense mangrove forests of the coast of Burma, the 54th Division of the Japanese Army had been forced to hide in retreat as the British military marched forward to capture the island. The area was pivotal for the Allied forces to control as it provided strategic advantage for setting up an airbase and conducting bombing missions in Malaysia and the wider Southeast Asia. The division was made up of 1,000 Japanese soldiers who found themselves outgunned and outnumbered. The area they controlled shrank smaller by the passing day as British foot soldiers stomped forward with full might, capturing or killing any Japanese soldier that resisted. Pushed further back along the coast, the Japanese troops were now in a deadly predicament. Between the British troops and the sea, the only place to run or hide was through the dense mangrove swamps of the Ramri Island. The battle continued for several weeks, and the Japanese troops had been feeding on small animals in the mangrove forest to keep themselves alive. Unbeknownst to them, the animals they were hunting were the primary prey of the giant saltwater crocodiles that heavily infested the dense swamp. Hundreds of these giant reptiles inhabited the swamp water and would resurface only to hunt and feed. Saltwater crocodiles are cold-blooded animals that go into periods of deep sleep in the wetlands, hiding in the water awaiting prey to come closer near the swamp shore. But now several weeks had passed, and the wild boars, fish, and crustaceans that constituted the crocodile's diet had been killed for food by the Japanese soldiers. It was the perfect storm. The crocodiles had started to go hungry, and hundreds of them now started to surface from beneath the swamp water looking for food. They would swim closer to the shore, peering their eyes above the water to see if any animal had walked close enough to attack. On one fateful day, on February 19, 1945, one of the soldiers was walking through the mangrove forest behind his platoon. He was entrusted with the responsibility of carrying an injured soldier on his back behind the team. However, walking for miles with his teammate on his shoulders had taken a toll on his body, and he had to slow down. The platoon reached the wetlands of the mangrove swamp, and it was decided that the only way forward was straight through the dense, muddy swamp. The soldier was cold, tired, and out of breath. Tried hard as he did, he could not keep pace with the rest of his team. The distance between him and his platoon started to grow, but the other soldiers had become too jaded to care. The water had further slowed him down until all he heard from his platoon was faint chattering in the distance. It soon fell silent in the dense Burmese forest, and he felt too exhausted to continue. But they were in the middle of the water, and stopping was not an option. He had to catch up to the team quickly, because the only chance of staying alive in the jungle war zone was safety in numbers. But the weight of the wounded soldier on his back and his slow steps in dense muddy swamp water made it difficult for him to regroup with his team. He then heard an eerie grunt behind him and felt the uneasy sensation that he was being watched. He realized how vulnerable he was with his hands carrying his wounded teammate and his legs stuck in the slow, thick mud of the swamp. He thought he was being chased by enemy soldiers or was the target of a British sniper close by. But not in his wildest dreams could he have known that the real danger lurked right beside his muddied feet. Suddenly, and without any other warning but the muffled grunt he had heard before, a 20-foot saltwater crocodile charged at him in the swamp, terrifying the soldier out of his senses. The monster reptile's gaping mouth with over 60 razor-sharp teeth more than 4 inches in length lunged at the soldier and caught his wounded teammate firmly in its tight grip. The soldier screamed at the top of his lungs and called for help from his team. He realized he could either save himself or let both die, and decided to run as fast as he could to safety. Stuck in the thick mud and frightened into inaction, he realized he was caught in the crocodile's turf. He didn't have the time to look back, nor the heart to watch his friend get torn to pieces alive as he screamed in agony. The attack had woken up dozens of more hungry crocodiles in the water, who gathered in a frenzy to feast on the man. He was dragged beneath the water, splashing and fighting for his life, but he was no match for the monster crocodiles as they shred him to pieces. The soldier could do nothing but watch in horror and keep walking to avoid the same fate. However, the body of the injured soldier was only a small meal that momentarily satiated the week-long hungry crocodiles. 
they had now tasted blood and wanted more. The soldier realized he was next as he noticed commotion in the water in front of him. More crocodiles started surfacing with their eyes on the soldier as their next prey. He soon felt a massive sharp bite on his leg beneath the water. The crocodile tore into his flesh, burying its sharp teeth deep into his thigh. It started to spin in the water with the soldier firm in its grip. He screamed in terror and shouted for help before being drowned and devoured by the beasts. By now the team ahead had heard the screams and realized that something was wrong. They thought it was an ambush by the British military, but they were hopelessly unaware that the real enemy swam right beside their feet in the swamp water. They moved slowly back to find the two missing soldiers, but all they could find was a pool of reddened swamp and floating flesh. They could not understand what had just happened and aimed their guns at the trees above fearing enemy snipers and traps. But soon after, dozens of saltwater crocodiles swam up closer to them beneath the water. The whirlpool of the water created by the charging crocodiles made it clear to them that it was too late. The 20-foot-long hungry beasts charged at once at the men, ripping off limbs and heads with one bite. The frantic and aimless gunshots of the soldiers could do nothing to stop the attack except injure a few crocodiles back into the water. They were caught in crocodile land, hopelessly vulnerable and unable to move. It was a feeding frenzy for the crocodiles. They bit into the soldiers' torso and legs and dragged them into the water to be devoured. The number of crocodiles increased as more and more bodies piled up. It was a snowball effect in a cynical fashion. The more dead soldiers, the more crocodiles came to feed on them. The soldiers screamed in terror, watching their colleagues get eaten alive but could do nothing except run. The commotion in the water had awoken hundreds of crocodiles in the 10-mile swamp that gathered to feast on the soldiers trapped in the dense swamp. Over a period of four days, more than 1,000 dead soldiers littered the water. Their half-eaten bodies and pieces of flesh reddened the mangrove swamp and told the horrifying tale of an entire military division being torn to shreds by monster crocodiles. The next morning, vultures dived from the sky to scavenge the leftover human flesh. The incident remains engraved in history as the most devastatingly gruesome animal attack ever recorded and left yet another bloody mark on the history of the Second World War. Out of the 1,000 soldiers from the 54th Division that went into the swamps, only 20 made it out alive. The stories they recounted painted a grim picture of what transpired on that fateful day, and the gore they witnessed in the vicious attack left them with more post-traumatic stress than anything they had gone through during the war, their friends being torn apart all around them, all meeting their horrifying final affliction. The Cape York Peninsula is a large peninsula located in far north Queensland, Australia. It is renowned for its unspoiled wilderness and abundance of natural beauty. With over 700 different land vertebrate species, including birds, bats, kangaroos, rodents, and reptiles like the freshwater crocodile or its gigantic and terrifying cousin, the saltwater crocodile. The deadly saltwater crocodile is the largest living reptile. Full-grown males sometimes reach around 6 meters in length and weigh between 1,000 to 1,300 kilograms. The saltwater crocodile is mostly crepuscular, meaning it's most active during twilight hours. It likes to spend its days lounging in the water or basking in the sun, waiting for nightfall so it can go on the hunt. Although they are relatively sluggish, saltwater crocodiles can be agile predators and show surprising agility and speed when necessary, usually when ambushing prey. Typically, when cruising, they travel at 3 to 5 kilometers per hour. Also similar to others in the crocodilian family, Saltwater crocodiles do not have a specific food preference and will eat whatever is available to them. This species has a long history of attacking humans who accidentally venture into its territory. Direct contact with the saltwater crocodile is likely fatal, almost certainly so if the predator manages to clamp down on his victim with its powerful jaws. The only recommended policy for dealing with saltwater crocodiles is to avoid their habitat when possible. To state that they are extremely aggressive when approached would be an understatement. It's also worth mentioning that a total of 106 people were killed by saltwater crocodiles in Australia from 1971 to 2013. The Kerr family was spending the evening at their remote camp, situated almost 40 meters from the shoreline of Bathurst Bay, on October 11, 2004. 
Bathurst Bay was a popular tourist destination in northern Queensland, Australia, situated near the Great Barrier Reef. Alicia Sorohan, along with her son Andrew and his family, who were all first-timers, had been camping here for the past six or seven years. Her husband, Bill, usually came too. The family went on a fishing trip to the beach. Later that day, they pitched their tents next to each other for convenience. Before going to sleep, Andrew gazed upon the beautiful night sky with his wife, Diane, and three-month-old son, Kelly. Because they were 30 to 40 meters away from the beach, they thought it would be quite a safe place. Little did they know about the horror that was to come. At approximately 4 a.m., a 4.5-meter saltwater crocodile came ashore after hunting along the coast. It's unclear whether the cold-blooded beast was looking for food or protecting its territory, but what is certain is that it had no regard for the humans who were now fast asleep in their tents. As it approached, what sounded like loud grunting noises and the rustling of leaves alerted Diane, who put aside four-month-old Kelly and leaped up to see where the noise was coming from. At first, she thought it could have been a pig, a dingo, or maybe even a wild bull. She heard the sounds of something getting closer to their campsite, and it sounded big. As Diane stared through the mosquito netting, the shadowy outline of an immense crocodile materialized, just a few feet away, gazing back at her through their tent flap. Diana quickly turned to Andrew and woke him up, shouting, There's a croc, Andrew! Andrew leaped up and crept outside of their tent to assess the danger, but as soon as he did, the menacing and cold green eyes of the crocodile, who was now right next to Andrew, greeted him. Andrew froze solid for a second in complete fear, and before he could figure out what to do, the beast lunged at him. The croc charged into their tent, tearing the bug netting with its teeth and grabbing Andrew by the hips. Andrew was terrified and likely in an enormous amount of pain as the croc's sharp teeth tore through flesh while its powerful jaws crushed bones and dragged him toward the water. This is common hunting behavior for crocodiles. They try to take their prey underwater, where they can finish them off without disturbance. The saltwater croc reigns supreme among all other predatory species by possessing the strongest bite in the animal kingdom far outclassing that of even the ferocious bull shark or the terrifying hippo. It can clamp down on prey with a devastating force that is estimated at about 3,700 pounds per square inch. That's more than four times the amount of force required to shatter a human's femur bone. Despite what Andrew was going through, his first thoughts were of the safety of three-month-old Kelly. Grab the baby D, he shouted. His blood-curdling screams woke up everyone in earshot. Alicia Sorohan was jolted awake by her son's screams coming from the next tent over. Bill ran to the side of the tent, looking for an axe. Her sons had weapons with them as they were hunting pigs. She pointed her flashlight to where the noise was coming from and witnessed in horror as Andrew was fighting for his life as the croc viciously shook its head and continued dragging him away. Her 61-year-old body may have been frail, but a mother's will and determination to protect her children are unshakable. She fearlessly ran toward the crocodile, leaping onto its head and gouging at its eyes. The croc spun around in an attempt to get away from her, but hit her, striking her down in the process and breaking both her nose and jaw. The beast let go of Andrew, who quickly made a run for it and shifted his gaze onto Alicia, who now lay badly injured and incapacitated. The crocodile latched its teeth onto her arm and started tearing it apart lacerating skin and mangling flesh and bone, all while once again attempting to drag his victim into the water. Her son Jason, who luckily had a gun close by, put his knee on the croc's head, mainly its neck area, and began unloading on the vicious animal. Took four good shots to the head before the crocodile finally stopped moving. When the dust settled, Andrew was lying with a broken right leg and left arm. He also had multiple puncture wounds on his arm and lower half. Needless to say, it was quite a shock for everyone when they saw him, especially considering he was less than a meter away from the crocodile who did it. Alicia was bleeding quite heavily, so her husband Bill and one of the other guys decided to put her into the land cruiser and drive her to the nearest place where a rescue chopper could pick her up from. The closest location happened to be a runway at Kalpawar Crossing, which was about seven hours away by car. Andrew wasn't severely injured, so the decision was made to leave him where he was while they took his mother to get help. He was helped by a first aid officer from a quarantine team who arrived via helicopter. His condition was stabilized after receiving the necessary first aid. His mother, however, wasn't faring as well. A crocodile's mouth is teeming with bacteria. 
The bacteria enter the crocodile's system through either the food it eats or the water in which it lives. The initial trauma of a crocodile bite is often fatal due to the creature's 60 teeth and crushing jaw power. However, some victims survive only to become infected with diseases that then lead to death or amputation. To make matters even worse, Alicia was old, meaning her immune system and resistance to infection may not be on par with her son's. Nonetheless, after patching her up and administering heavy doses of antibiotics to help her body fight the infection, doctors were finally able to stabilize her condition. A few days after being admitted to Karen's hospital, she was reported to be doing well and was discharged. I did what I had to do. He needed help and I was there. I was the first one there so I just jumped on the croc and that was it. Andrew had feared the worse. Once it had my leg, I thought I was going to die. I thought this is it. Alicia Sorohan tragically passed away in May 2020. Until her final moments, she maintained that any mother would have done what she did to defend her son and grandson. I'm no hero, she said repeatedly. While the family's survival is credited in no small part to the bravery of everyone involved, don't let their story fool you into thinking an encounter with this terrifying reptilian species is anything but a guaranteed one-way ticket to the afterlife. The average male saltwater crocodile measures at about 5.5 meters in length. But the crocodile which terrorized the Kerr family, on the other hand, was only 4.5 meters in length. The weight of a crocodile increases cubically as length increases, meaning actual crocodiles that are 5.5 meters long would weigh more than twice as much and be much more powerful and dangerous than the crocodile in our story, who likely hasn't even reached full maturity. We must be mindful when we enter the wilderness where wild animals live, as it is their home before ours. Needless to say, there have been instances where humans have paid the price for recklessness, sometimes with their lives. Nature doesn't always take kindly to outsiders, as the Kerr family learned the hard way. So, stay within safe boundaries, take all necessary precautions, and always come prepared, because if you don't, you may just end up as another victim of nature's cruelty your consciousness slipping away as you're plagued with your final affliction.